Tough times don't last forever. There is no doubt that we are all tired of the sorrows, pains, and deadness pervading the land. I have good news for you. Christ has come to guarantee true change this April at the Deeper Life National Easter Retreat. It's your time to experience Christ's resurrection power. From Thursday 6th to Monday 10th, April 2023, Join the nearest Deeper Life Retreat location around the globe. Christ's power will be unveiled by Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui and other anointed men of God. Everyone is welcome. The retreat time is a time of waiting before the Lord. I want to plead with you. Be present in every session. The Lord will fill your cup to overflowing. Come and taste of Christ's resurrection power. It's real. Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege we have tonight again to come to the Bible study. We pray that the principles we learn of today will be made applicable in our personal lives by the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. We're praying that as we learn these principles, these examples and lessons in our lives, it will make us better Christians and better people in Jesus' name. We're praying that you apply all these things to our hearts again today so that the people that relate and react with us will know that we're being with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered and we'll see the manifestation of what we're learning in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. We have been studying from the book of Proverbs for a period of time now. And we have gone from chapter to chapter. You would have discovered, however, in the study that we have done, that many of the principles and lessons that we are reading from the book of Proverbs are sometimes repeated for emphasis. You will find that what you have read in earlier chapters one way or the other, one form or the other, comes up again in the later chapters of the book of Proverbs. That is done deliberately because many of the principles are so pertinent, so very important, essential to Christian living, to godly living, that those things start to be repeated over and over again. Therefore, I'm encouraging that every believer will take the book of Proverbs and read chapters from the book as often as possible. But now for the purpose of study. Sometimes when we study and we're repeating the same principles and lessons over and over, it doesn't make for interesting study for many people. And because of that, what we have done today is to make selection of different verses from different chapters and bring out things that are very, very important for us in our personal lives and bring them under some topics, under some headings. 
And today, we'll be looking at four different things, if time permits. Look at the outline. We'll be talking on the tongue of the wise. Two, we'll be talking on tenderness toward the weak. And three, training that is to be a watch word. Then teaching and warnings. Let me just say a little about each of those subtitles before we go in depth into them. The tongue of the wise. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the fool and about the wise. And there are different ways in which each of these categories of people are marked out. But one point that stands out very clear is the tongue of the wise or the tongue of the foolish. It says, if you want to know whether a man is wise or whether he is foolish, if you want to know whether a man is mature, developing, growing, or is immature, is lacking in growth, lacking in spiritual perception, look at what comes out of his mouth. That his tongue will betray him to show what kind of a person he is, wise or foolish. And then the tenderness towards the weak. The Bible makes us to understand that one way in which you know an individual, whether he is more like God or he is like the fallen, depraved human beings, or he has even gone to the very level of animals, wild beasts, that the thing that will make you to know what type of person he is, is the tenderness or the callousness in which he reacts or acts with the people around him, especially his attitude to the weak. And even when you look at a nation, well, you'll know whether that nation is good or bad in the way the nation plans for the weak. The weak unborn babies are tenderness towards them as a governmental body, as a group of people, whether we're the type of people that can just get rid of those weak unborn babies or we have tenderness, it will show what type of nation that we have. And also, the weak, the infirm, and the poor, and the needy, and the invalids in the land, and the aged in the land, the society, whether the society is good or not, will show in the tenderness or the callousness we have towards the weak. Now come back to the believer as an individual. How you know a believer, whether he's tender or callous, whether he's following Christ, Christ-like or carnal, it will show in his attitude, interaction, and help, love, tenderness towards the weak. Then the training, I said it should be a watchword. As you look at the nation, you, you like to see where the nation is putting its emphasis. If the nation is only trying to solve the problem of the present, and they have no future. The nation has no future. In thinking about the training, the education of our children, of the young, it will tell you the direction in which the educational system is going. will tell you whether it's a wise nation or not. The same thing as you look at the church. If the church will look at the training of the people that are coming into the church, the new converts, the young believers, and the children in the church, the emphasis that the church places on training will show you whether that is a church that is thinking about a solid future for that church or not. But in any nation, any nation where there is no emphasis on the education of the children, our children, the teeming millions of the young people in society, where there is no formal training, where there is no education, where there is no vocational provision, made for those young people you know the nation is not grabbing and grasping with the problems that we ought to be looking into now the families the priorities that the parents the fathers and the mothers set for the training of their children will tell you whether that family is good or whether it is thoughtless and then the teachings and the warnings and the proverbs the book of proverbs is full of teachings, lessons, illustrations, examples, and warnings. Just to tell us how we ought to lead our lives. What direction we ought to go. Now, we'll see how far we go today. We'll continue another time if we're not able to finish up today. 
Now look at the tongue of the wise. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible is telling us something here that is so very common around us. Something you can observe, something I can observe. But you see many times, my brother, my sister, we do not observe important, essential things in life. Look at those two words, death and life. We try to avoid death. We try to run away from death. And yet, the Bible is telling us, if you are running away from death, and yet you do not know that right on the tip of your tongue, there is a possibility of you killing yourself, destroying yourself, ruining your life, just on the tip of your tongue, that you are not running fast enough away from death. And then it says, life. It's also in the power of the tongue. We desire life. We want to live. We want the abundant life. And yet, many of us will feel that it's only that the people around us do not want us to live the abundant life. But my brother, my sister, the Bible has this to tell you. That if you are not living the abundant life, the problem is not people around you. The problem is right on the tip of your tongue. That if you want life, look at how you use your tongue. That if you have been experiencing death, slow death, gradual death, sometimes sudden death, sometimes terrible spiritual defeat and death, that the problem is our tongue, your tongue, my tongue. Look at this one by one. Death is in the power of the tongue. What killed the majority of people in the wilderness? Now there were a lot of things that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness, but you know, the one thing that stands out very clearly is the way they misused their tongue. They murmured, they grumbled, they complained, until even God, in the greatness of his mercy, until even God, in the greatness of his patience, he said, I must disinherit these people. Because of their complaint and their murmuring, many of them bleached their bones in the wilderness. That means they died in the wilderness until there was not even a chance to bury any of those people that were dying because of the misuse of their tongue. Let's pick them up one by one. Miriam, although she didn't die, but her skin was almost destroyed with leprosy for a time. You know what happened? Because of the use of her tongue. She couldn't enjoy the communion life the community life, the fellowship life of the children of Israel for some time. She had to be taken to the back side, outside the camp. What segregated and separated her? It was the misuse of her tongue. Do you remember even Moses himself, that greatly respected man of the Old Testament? Many qualities of his life that we praise the Lord for. But if there was anything that made that man not to be able to inherit the fullness of the inheritance that was available for him. It was the use of his tongue. Would you remember the case of Samson? What made him to face premature death? What killed him before his time? What snatched away his ministry from him? Wasn't it the use of his tongue? That man talked too much. He talked his life away. There's a woman in the Bible, the wife of David, Michael by name. That woman could have had children, but the misuse of her tongue deadened her reproductive system, barrenness setting because of the misuse of her tongue. Would you remember the son of Solomon that had a wise king, a wise father before him? By taking many wives before he died. But then the kingdom was in the hand of his son. And then the elders of the land, they came to him and he said, Things were difficult for us. The oppression with which we were oppressed, it was so great. Now, make it easy for us. And he said, go again, and I'll call you back. So I'll tell you how the kingdom will go, what direction we're going to go. And the advisors and the counselors, 
They told him, if you talk softly, they said, the prosperity, the progress of the kingdom is on the tip of your tongue. If you use that kingdom aright, that you, you have prosperity and progress and the people will serve you. He called the younger people. And he said, young people, what do you see? And those people, they ruined the man, they ruined his kingdom, they ruined his future, they ruined his family by the advice they gave him. And you know, sometimes young people, they talk much more than old people. Old people because of experience in life. Old people because of what they have suffered already. Old people before, because of what they have observed already. They are very careful about the use of their tongue. That is those who are learning their lesson. But the younger generation, the younger generation, they talk too much. And they say things that will destroy their lives, destroy the kingdom, destroy the unity of united people. And so, the son of Solomon spoke to those people roughly. The kingdom broke on his head. His happiness was taken away. Prosperity was taken away. You know what cost it? The use of his tongue. That's why the Bible is saying here, death is in the power of the tongue. Come on to the New Testament and look at the father of John the Baptist. As the angel appeared unto him, and told him that his prayer had come as a memorial before the Lord. And that man, he could have kept quiet, he could have been meditating on the word of God, he could have said, Lord, Lord, thy will be done. But he spoke unadvisedly with his tongue, and that made that man to be dead for nine months, until John the Baptist was born. Do you remember a man in the New Testament, Herod by name? He came out and he spoke in pride and arrogance. And then he received the honor that should have been given unto God. An angel came from heaven and smote him and he died. You have had enough now of examples and illustrations of death in the power of the tongue. And yet it says life is also in the power of the tongue. And people like Abigail will come to your mind in the Old Testament. The people that knew, the people that understood the use of the tongue. And that man, David himself, who watched his tongue. David himself, because of the sufferings and the oppositions and the oppressions in life, when somebody came and told him about the death of Saul, the greatest of the enemies that David had, what did he do? He did not allow his tongue to betray him. And he said, how are the mighty fallen? And he wept when he heard of the death of Saul and Jonathan. Even when the report of the death of Absalom came to him. You know how he wept? You know how he spoke out? And the people, they knew that King David was not an injurious person. The people loved him. The people respected him. They honored him. Why? Because of the use of his tongue. Look at Jesus Christ. And look at his life. What strikes you in the life of Jesus Christ? Yes, I know he healed the sick. Oh yes, I know he raised the dead. Oh yes, I know he did a lot of wonderful things, miraculous things, wonders and signs. But have you ever thought about it? How he talked, how he used his tongue with his own disciples, with his people, and with the people that are weak and poor, with the women and the children, very, very tender, very, very nice, very, very loving, in the use of a song. Nobody could ever catch him saying something that was wrong. Life is in the power of the tongue. And so, one lesson that we must make sure we learn before we close the book of Proverbs and go to another book to study. One thing we must be able to say as we learn through the chapters of the book of Proverbs, we must be able to say we learned about the tongue. Because I don't think there's any other book where the Bible talks about the slanderer, the talebearer, the liar, the deceiver, and the people that will misuse the tongue as the book of Proverbs. I do not know there is any other book in the Bible where verse after verse, Chapter after chapter, the book talks about the softness of the tongue, the tenderness in the tongue, the kindness in the tongue. And it says, 
if you use it aright, there is death. There is life. If you use it in the wrong way, then there is death. Let's look at some other verses concerning the tongue that amplifies and explains what I've been telling you now about the use of the tongue. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth age, it is folly and shame unto him. He that answereth a matter before he heareth age, it is shame and folly unto him. Have you realized in our families, the things that bring a lot of troubles for us and we do not enjoy our families. The husband is trying to pass a point across to the wife. The husband has not landed. The husband has not concluded. And the wife already is making a reply. My sister, that's what is causing the problem in that family. Because you do not have the patience and the control and the restraint over your tongue and allow your husband to land. Allow your husband to tell everything that he wants to tell before you will make a reply. What causes problem between mothers and children? Because sometimes the children, they are, they are giving a complaint. A complaint that something is paining them, something is injuring them. Before they land, before they conclude, the mother is saying, oh yes, I know what you want. He says, mommy, let me finish. Mommy, I have not told you exactly what I want. Oh yes, I know what you want. And there is confusion. And those children will feel that mommy does not love children enough. Do you know what causes problem between in-laws and those, uh, those families? Your mother-in-law, your, your brother-in-law living with you, or your father-in-law that comes to spend some time with you. We talk too much. Before father-in-law has finished, we think, oh yes, father-in-law is trying to accuse me. I'm not taking care of him very well. I'm not taking care of the son very well. I'm not going to allow him to make that conclusion. Then we come in. And they say, how rude is this girl? How rude is this daughter-in-law? We judge the matter before we hear it. Do you know in the office what gets us into a problem between the boss and the subordinate? Because the subordinate is not willing that the boss should finish talking before we reply. But then it says, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. In the church, sometimes, we have to settle between brother and brother, sister and sister, between members of the church, workers in the church. And sometimes, you know, we who are in the leadership, we must be very careful because the first person that talks to you will appear like an angel. Oh, he, he builds up his case, he tells you everything, and he brings, he bails himself out. You say, this man is an angel, this woman is an angel. But my brother leader, you have not heard the matter until you hear the second side of the story. You have not heard of the matter fully until you listen to the other people, to the other person that has been accused. But if you will judge, if you will answer, if you will make a response before you hear everything, then it means that it, the Bible says you are a fool and there will be shame among the students. You know sometimes how students fail an exam, oral exam, because that student thinks he's overconfident, self-confident. That student feels, I've studied that subject, practical subject. It may be French, it may be English, it may be music, it may be physical education, it may be some of these practical subjects, or some of the subjects who have to go into the laboratory, and the, the examiner is asking a question. And the student will not allow that examiner to finish answering the question. He jumps in and he makes a mess of the whole thing. He fails that exam. Even in the written papers. Do you see the children that are to write essay in English language? Overconfident. Very, very self-confident. He knows all the grammar. He has been leading the class every time. And so he knows. He just walks into the, into the exam hall confidently. And he reads the question because of the overconfidence. He tries to answer the question without reading the question thoroughly. He fails that exam. And he cries and he says, God, why did I fail? I've been the best student in the class. Yes, my brother's student, my sister's student. 
because you try to answer without understanding and reading properly, thoroughly, the question that you are trying to answer. He that answereth a matter, he that tries to solve a problem, he that tries to answer a question before he understands the question, before he understands the problem, it says it is folly and it is shame unto him. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. You see, Proverbs is not just interested in getting us saved. Proverbs is interested in making us live a life of the saved man. The book of Proverbs is not just interested in getting us converted. The book of Proverbs is helping us to live a converted life. The book of Proverbs is not just interested in making us to know God. The book of Proverbs is interested in making us to walk with God. Proverbs chapter 20. And I'm reading verse 22. Say thou not, say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. The book of Proverbs is very, very practical. Very, very practical. Now think, think about this. Written so many years ago, and yet practical, applicable, even today, my brother, my sister, you know, our human nature. Now we have to be sincere. Very, very sincere. Our little children at home, if you have more than one, when one child has done something bad, to the other child. The other child will reply and say, I'll do the same thing back to you. That's our carnal nature. That's our depraved nature. That's the evidence of the Adamic nature. But you know, even our students at school, secondary school, they are at school, and one student does something bad to them, reporting them to the teacher, or reporting them to the principal or headmaster, or spoiling a page of the exercise book by plotting, by uh, putting ink on it, or doing something against that student in class. What's the reaction in the heart of that student? The first reaction is, you did that to me, I'll do it back to you, I'll repay you. If we're not careful, then we get, uh, we get into adult life, and you get married. And listen to me now, even though you're a believer, the temptation, the tendency is in your heart that your wife has done something you didn't like it. You didn't like it. Maybe something personal, something private, something that is only to be done in the privacy of your room between husband and wife. And the wife reacted a particular way. The wife did something. It shocked you. It disappointed you. It made you to feel, why am I married? If this woman will do like this to me and deny me of this and that, you ought to understand what I'm saying. But you know, the carnal nature within us will say, all right, you did that to me. I will not talk. I will not even say I'm making any reaction, but I'll watch for an opportunity. I'll repay you. You know that carnality in our hearts? You know that depravity in our hearts? And you know why? Sometimes it may be the husband has neglected you. And the husband has not done the right thing to you. It may be that he has spoken to his own parents, your in-laws, in a bad light. As if you were not a good wife. And maybe the husband just made a mistake. And then you knew about it. And you suffered a little from your in-laws because of your, what your husband has said about you. A momentary misuse of a song before the parents. And in your mind, the temptation. In your mind, the reaction, saying, he did that to me, all right, I cannot divorce him. I cannot uh, even tell him that I don't like this, I don't have the boldness, I'm not that uh, extrovert that will challenge him, but I will repay him. I'll teach him a lesson. I know what, where he can get me. I know where I can get him. When he makes a demand on me, at that time I will repay him, I'll deny him. You know that carnality in our hearts? You know, in the church sometimes, as children of God, we offend one another because we are not in heaven yet. Sometimes, because of our forgetfulness, I may forget something that I should have done to you. You may forget something you should have done to me. It's part of our life, part of our life as brothers and sisters. We may even be perfect in our heart, loving in our heart, but our head is not perfect. 
our memory is not perfect. And because of the lack and the immaturity in our mind, we forget something. And therefore, what I forget may hurt you. What you forget may hurt me. We may hurt and disappoint one another. But then you know the carnality of our heart. I'll show him. I will repay him. And it's so practical in life. In the place of work, you know sometimes they are, they are distributing something. All the community of the workers there, they said they are going to buy soft fish together. They are going to buy a bag of, they are going to buy a bag of rice together. They are going to buy beans together. And they will share. And the time they were contributing the money. Maybe you went out on assignment. Before you came back, they had planned everything. And there was a fellow brother. There is a fellow brother in that place of work. And he knows that there is austerity. He knows that you are going to get that rice and that gari or that beans or the milk or the bomb bitter at half price because of doing it commu in community life together. He didn't remember to mention your name. Everybody forgot you. You came back. The time they were distributing the fish and the stock fish, you were just looking at them. Oh, they said, Mr. So-and-so, your reward is in heaven. Everybody forgot you. You kept quiet. You look at your fellow brother, member of the same church, working in the same place. You look at him carrying his own rice and carrying his own fish. You say, uh-huh, that's Christianity. Look at him now. And he came to you and said, my brother, I, I don't know why I forgot all about this. I'm very sorry about Ah, uh, No, sorry. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And in your mind, I will show him. I will repay him. He did that to me. He did that to me. I will repay him. You know, my brother, my sister... That's the tendency of our hearts. That's the temptation that we have. That's the carnality that is embedded in our nature. But then it says, go to the cross, have it crucified. Never, never say to your husband, I will repay him with evil. Never, never say to your in-laws, I will repay them with evil. Never say to your fellow brother, your fellow sister, I will recompense them with evil. As we are in the church, let's just enjoy one another, love one another, appreciate one another. You step on my toes, I step on your toes. We offend one another unconsciously, unintentionally. Forget about it and do not be going behind and say, I will recompense evil. Just forgive and forget. Wait on the Lord and it shall save thee. If you wait on the Lord and you are not revenging yourself. You are not retaliating to defend yourself. If you wait on the Lord, the Lord will reward every one of us in Jesus' name. Never say, never say in the church, in the family, at school, in the place of work, I will recompense him. He has done evil to me, I'll do bad to him again. Never say that. Never say that. Look at Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth, and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. If you check up in your life, if I check up in my life, how many troubles have we plunged ourselves into? Because we didn't control our tongues. We spoke too much. It is, you know, sometimes we refer to people in the Bible. Like some of the people I've mentioned today in our lesson, in our teaching today. Like Moses that I mentioned, Miriam that I mentioned, Samson that I mentioned. But then, if we look at our lives, we'll see that the examples are right here in our lives. If you keep your mouth, if you keep your tongue, you keep yourself from trouble, from snare. Let's look at what another part of the Bible says. In James chapter 3. James chapter 3. From verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle, to control, to restrain the whole body. You see in our families, when the wife locks the door and begins to weep and says, I don't enjoy this marriage. I don't like this marriage. I didn't know this is the type of marriage I will have in my life. Most of the time, it's not because of money. Sometimes it is. Most of the time, it is not because of anything physical. Sometimes it is. But most of the time, it's because of the tongue. 
It's because of the tongue. My brother, if you do not have money and you have nice word for your wife, my brother, if you do not have property and you have kind words for your family, my sister, if you do not have too much beauty, but then you have kind words, a smile on your face every time, you never complain, you never grumble, you make the life of that husband heaven on earth. If you do not know too much, you cannot speak too much grammar. You, do not, you are not an extrovert. You are not a boisterous person. You are not a forward person. You are not somebody that will jump here and jump there. But you just have nice word, nice word. And you just make up your mind from morning till evening. I'll never speak any word that will make my husband unhappy. Your husband will forget all the other lack in your life. Sincerely, honestly. Your husband will forget that you don't have good grammar. Your husband will forget that you are not uh, the queen Nigeria, the, the queen of Nigeria, the beauty of Nigeria. Your husband will be satisfied with the woman that will talk nice from morning till evening. Never complain, never murmur, never grumble, never speak anything harsh to your husband or to the people in the vicinity, in the home area. And husband, you may not have too much money. You may not have too much property. You may not be able to buy clothes every month. You may not be able to buy all the gadgets that, in, that is needed at home. But just nice words, nice words, beautiful words from morning till evening. When your wife is slow, you can correct that sluggishness in kind words, kind words. When your wife is a little bit faster than you expect, you can correct that attitude with kind words. And if you'll make up your mind and you'll say, the greatest offense in this family is the way we use our tongue. And I'm going to watch my tongue. I'm going to control my tongue. I'm going to bridle my tongue. Your wife will be happier. Your husband will be happier. The children will be happier. For in many things we offend all, brothers and sisters. Honestly, if you look at the problems we are talking about in our zones, I don't think they are great, great problems. Sometimes it looks very great, but I don't think they are very great problems. You know why? Because most of the time, it's the way I talk about you. It's the way you talk about me. Most of the time, what will make a man, a woman so discouraged and he will say, I will park out of this zone, I will go to another zone, most of the time, it's because of the use of the tongue. It's not a very, very great problem that we couldn't solve. Most of the time, what drives a man, a woman, from this house fellowship, and makes him to go to a far away house fellowship is that they are all talking about me. They are all gossiping about me. That mistake I made last year, nobody has forgotten about it. Everybody is talking about me. My brother, my sister, one of the greatest problems we have in our human interaction and family is the use of our tongue. You know, if I make up my mind that I'm going to use my tongue in the right way, if you make up your mind, you are going to use your tongue in the right way, life will be more, more pleasure, more pleasurable for everybody, happier for everybody. For many things to offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. You want to be perfect? You are praying and crying all the time, Oh Lord, look at my imperfection. Look at my imperfection. My brother, you'll never be perfect until your tongue is under control. Sister, you are, you are sorrowful about your immaturity, about your carnality, about your imperfection. You'll never be perfect until your tongue is under control. You want a perfect family, a happy family, a joyous family. Your family will never have perfect happiness, uninterrupted happiness. Until both of us, husband and wife, will learn to control our tongue. You want to have perfect fellowship in our church here, in the, in the house fellowship, in the zone, in the area, or in the central church community here. My brother, my sister, will never have perfect fellowship in the church until we learn to control our tongue. And it says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Able also to bridle, to control, to restrain the whole body. Look at James chapter 1, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, 
this man's religion is vain. Don't let us be religious, but let's be really spiritual. And to be spiritual and not carnal, we'll need to bring our tongue under control. From all this that we've been learning, more than anything else, your tongue, my tongue, often reveals what kind of people we are. A spirit-controlled man is known by the control that he has over his spirit and over his tongue. A loose tongue is an evidence of a carnal heart and of an unchristian life. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Oh, you may say there is no mention of the tongue there. You need to understand that Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If there is no control over my mind, if there is no control over my spirit, if there is no control over my thoughts, there will be no control over my tongue. And he that has no rule, he that has no control over his own spirit, over his own thoughts, over his own mind is like a city that is broken down without walls. In the days of old, the walls stood as protection for the city. In the days of old, they will build a very strong wall, a very thick wall, a very high wall against a city for protection. To shield all the wild animals away. To shield all the snakes and all the scorpions away. To shield, in particular, the enemy soldiers away from that city. Do you remember Jericho? As long as the cities were up, as long as the walls, rather, were up, they felt secured. They felt secured. There was no danger. But the moment that the walls broke down, then the people entered in. They captured the city. Do you remember Belshazzar? He was confident. He was living in security because he knew the walls around the city of Babylon, nobody could penetrate. He didn't know that the enemies were making an inroad through, through the wall, uh, under the gate, so they can get into the city. Now on your life, if there is no control over your tongue, no control over your spirit, no control over your thoughts, no control over your mind, you know what that means? Your walls are broken down. Serpents and scorpions will come in. Demons and evil spirits will come in. Evil thoughts will lodge in your heart if there is no control. Then it means that enemies will come in. There will be no protection. Because if your tongue is loose, the protecting wall is broken down. You know, in our families, you expose yourself, you expose the family to danger. You know, in our church, sometimes we expose the central church or the lo or the the um, division, the district, or the zone into danger because of the use of our tongue. The walls are broken down. The walls are broken down. But it is the control of my tongue and the control of your tongue that keeps the wall of protection up. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 20. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Seest thou a man that is hasty in giving out a promise? Here we are, the Bible study. And we finish the Bible study. And somebody came to you and he said, Can you be my business partner? You don't even know him. You don't know whether he's dependable or not, trustworthy or not, honest or dishonest. And then you give out your word. You say, Yes, I'll be a business partner to you. You have ruined yourself. You just knew somebody last week. A casual friend. He was a perfect stranger before last week. And then he says, can you be my wife? Oh, well, you say, that's all right. I've been looking for a husband myself. You get into danger. Says thou a lady that is hasty in giving out a word of promise, there is more hope of a fool than of him. The Bible has a lot to say about fools. And it has this to say, that the fool will be destroyed. What when the Bible says that there is more hope for a fool than for you. Look at verse 11. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. You know, sometimes we have 
uh, district meeting with uh, our zonal leaders, the coordinator leading them. Sometimes we have a meeting with all the zonal leaders together. Sometimes in the district you have some of the selected workers together and we're having a meeting. And in that meeting, uh, when, we, when we give out the points and the ideas, we need to discuss this, we need to discuss this. There are some people, they don't think, they don't meditate, they are not patient. Immediately we sound uh, a note and we just say, this is what we are discussing. That zonal leader, that other person, he begins to talk. And he says all his mind in five minutes. Everybody is looking at him. Why doesn't he think a little? Why doesn't he meditate a little? Because he says he full uttereth all his mind. But the wise man, he thinks, he meditates, he weighs the words he's going to speak out, how profitable, how necessary those words are before he speaks his mind. Now we have learned practical lessons for our families, for our church, and for our places of work, on what it means to put our tongues under control. Let's go to the next point. Tenderness toward the weak. As I told you before, if you want to know the value and the worth of a nation, the stability of a nation, look at the attitude we have towards the weak. And if you are thinking of the weak in our society, I said the unborn babies are weak. They are defenseless. They cannot defend themselves. They are poor. They have no argument against whatever anybody may like to do against them. And what you do to those unborn, weak, innocent babies will tell whether you are on the side of God or you are on the other side. The aged in a society, aged men, aged women, those that are infirm, invalid, not able to help themselves, generally they are poor. They are not catered for. And the value of a man's life will tell in whichever way is caring for the helpless, hopeless, aged people. Sometimes we have the people that are deformed in society. And what society is doing about them? The blind, the lame, the poor, the needy. What the society is doing will show what type of society it is. But now let's come to the church. In the church will have the poor, the needy, the infirm, and those that cannot cater for themselves. The attitude of the brethren, the attitude of the zone, the attitude of the central church, the whole church, to the weak, to the poor, to the needy, to the infirm, to the aged, to the babies, will tell what type of church that is. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 19. Verse 17, he that has pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he has given will he pay him again. He that has pity upon the poor, my brothers and sisters, before we were converted, we used to ridicule the poor. We laugh about them. We make fun of them. I have seen families, unconverted families, they sit around the table and they make fun of the poor. But my brother, my sister, the evidence of conversion is that we have honor, we have respect for the poor. Now, if we're honoring the rich and we're ridiculing the poor, what difference do we have between us and the people of the world? If we put the poor to shame, the poor among us, if we put them to shame, we ridicule them, we report them, we abuse them. We tell them, sit down there on the ground, and then we honor the rich. What's the difference between us and the people of the world? But my brother, my sister, the thing that shows that we are godly is that we are like God. The thing that shows that we are Christian is that we are like Christ. What do we learn about God? God gives. God gives. Apart from the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Apart from that, from the beginning of the Bible, look at it. He made the world, he gave it unto Adam and Eve. Look at it. He rescued the world from the watery grave and from the flood and he gave it unto Noah and his sons. Look at it. He gave health. He gave enjoyment. He gave happiness. He gave rain. He gave sunshine. God has always been given. Why do we pray? 
because we know it is the nature of God to give. We pray for healing because we know he will give. We pray for prosperity because we know he will give. We pray for happiness because we know the nature of God is to give. In the Old Testament, the thing that marks you out as a godly man is that you are benevolent, you are loving, you are tender, you give like God. Look at Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about Jesus Christ? He left heaven. He left all the good, good things in heaven. And he came to this world. You know when he came to this world? Not to grab, not to receive, but to give out. To give out. The climax of it all is that he gave his very life. But even before then, he gave healing. He gave forgiveness. He gave salvation. He gave peace of mind. He gave deliverance. He gave every good and perfect gift that anybody could ask. He gave every time. Look at even when they, were, when they betrayed him. And Peter cut off the ear of Malchus down. He picked up again, again and he gave that man his ear back again. Look at Jesus Christ. He was always giving. My brother, my sister, how can you be a Christian? And you never give. There are poor people all around us. You have many shirts. I have many shirts. They are all there in the wardrobe. You see some of these ushers that are standing there. Very devoted and very dedicated. But you see them wearing the same shirt for the whole year. Do you ever think of giving them shirts? See those members of the choir? And if you see their dedication and their love for the ministry, for the work of the Lord. If I told you, some of our members of the choir, they will walk from their faraway zones and they will come to parties on Wednesday. Because of the love they have. And yet, it will never enter my mind. It will never enter your mind. These dedicated people, the same shoes they have been wearing since we knew them. Some of them, that's what they are still wearing. The same pairs of trousers that they have been wearing. Some of them, they are patched here and there. It never enters my mind. It never enters your mind. I must give something to that, my fellow brother, dedicated, yielded in the work of the Lord. You know what we do? When I cannot wear that shirt anymore, I use it to scrub floor. Oh, somebody in the church needs that clothes. I shouldn't use it like that. When I do not need that pair of trousers anymore, I use it to scrub the floor. I shouldn't do that. There are people that I just, if I could just give it to them like that, those pairs of shoes that I just throw away, I shouldn't throw them away. There are people that need them. Because the nature of God is to give. The nature of God is to be loving. The nature of God is to be benevolent. He that has pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. My brother, I must ask you this. My sister, I must ask you this question. Do you know when you are coming from your zone and you are coming to the Bible study, there are some loving brothers, loving sisters, they do not have money for transportation. Have you ever paid for them? Have you ever considered them? Have you ever given them? Brothers and sisters, we're living together. In a particular house. Here is that brother in that, in that room. Here is that brother in this other room. The brother here is walking. The other brother is not walking. And then the brother said, My brother, when you go to Bible study today, collect the outline for me. And the other brother will say, That's alright. He will not ask him, My brother, why will you not go? I'll pay your transportation. I know why you don't want to go is because there is no money, but I'll pay for you. I'm sorry, I feel guilty that I've never asked you of your welfare. But my brother, instead of just collecting outline for you, come on, let's go together. I'll pray for you. Or sometimes we see our brother. You're living together. You are cooking in the kitchen. And brother did not come out today to cook at all. And um, yesterday, what happened to him? And we just cook in the kitchen and we go away. Or it may be two sisters living together. You have cooked in the kitchen that everybody is using in that place. And the other sister did not come to the kitchen today to even cook anything. Ah, if uh, he has, she has soup at home, will she not even warm the soup? No question at all. And eventually, on the third day, she sent for the zona leader. I'm having stomach problems, stomach ache. And zona leader came and said, Sister, what's happening to you? I'm having stomach ache. Why? Are you eating at all? Well, since three days ago now, there was nothing to eat. What? Now, sister, come here. Are you not living together? This sister said that since three days ago, she didn't, uh, she didn't eat anything. And now she's having stomach problem. 
Well, she didn't tell us when you didn't see her in the kitchen, why didn't you ask of her? When you didn't see her coming to cook, coming to warm any soup, why didn't you ask her? My brother, my sister, we're guilty. We're guilty of carnality. We're guilty of selfishness. We're guilty of being stingy. Since when have you given money to your fellow brother, fellow sister? Shirt, dress, your fellow brother, your fellow sister. We have sisters in the choir. We have sisters among the ushers. We see them. They are the people that make the worship convenient for us. We see them wearing the same dress every time. Nobody ever gets concerned. We have full-time workers. That outline in your hand. We have some people that work day and night. Do you see how they dress, some of them? Did you ever tell them, my brother, I have a parcel for you. We should do that. Sometimes in your zone, you find a family. They've got a child. Or they've got two children. My brother, my sister. Have you ever seen somebody having children and being sorrowful? They have children, and instead of being joyful and happy and telling everybody, they are sad. They say, well, why? The children came at a time we are not even ready. No milk, no egg, nothing at all. And then the old wrapper that the woman had is what they cut into pieces so that they can make them. Um, they can make dapper for the uh, for the for the child. And nobody will ask. They will just say, "We we'll rejoice with you." The person you are rejoicing with, well said. Well, it is good the child has come, but we are not ready. Well, just rejoice, just rejoice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have a child. What's the name of the child? Well, go and ask the mother. And you see that man is not happy. Why didn't you find out? Why that man that has a new child is not happy? Because you need to give something. Everybody needs to give something and make life easy, make life happy for everybody. My brothers and sisters, let us begin to give. Even from this very night, let us begin to help one another. Love one another. Do not neglect one another. You have anything, share with other people. Clothing, food, material things. Share with other people. He that has pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he has given will he pay him again. Whatever you give, God will repay every one of us in Jesus' name. Now I know that we have not finished the outline. Now what should we do? Do we just read all the references of the Bible in our head and never do good? Just quote Bible? Or should we just read one verse and then practice that one verse? I think that is better, that we read one verse and we practice it. And we come back next Monday again, read another verse, practice it again. The people that God will bless are those who are hearing the word of God and doing the word of God. Let's look at James. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Let's be doers of the word. We have heard today about the use of the tongue. We have heard today about tenderness to the poor, tenderness to the weak, kindness and love and benevolence to the people around us. By the grace of God, we are going to practice it. I said we are going to practice it. We are going to help one another. We are going to love one another. We are going to encourage one another. We are going to be a blessing to one another. Let's rise up and repent of our stinginess, our selfishness, and the wrong use of our tongue. And let's promise the Lord from now on. We are going to be nice to our fellow brothers. Nice to our fellow sisters. Nice to the needy people and the poor people around us. People in the zone. People in the area. People in the house fellowship. People in your district. People in the central church here. Full time workers. Part time workers. Everybody around here. Talk to the Lord in prayer.